Hey everybody, this is Kevin for Crackberry.com. Hey, it's Phil from Android Central and I am totally paying attention. <laughs> Derek from WebOS Nation and I am definitely not. Daniel Rubino from WPCentral.com and I'm actually awake, kind of. And this is Renee for iMore.com and this is Mobile Nations, our cross-platform, cross-industry, cross-cultural podcast where we bring you everything that is good, wholesome, and worth discussing in the smartphone and tablet space as of roughly 3 p.m. Eastern Time today. Is that accurate, Kevin? That's totally accurate. And is this our first like full-out video Mobile Nations podcast of 2012? It is. It's, and it's post-CES. It's post-Blackberry DevCon. It's post-Phil getting 800 new devices. Wow, so we've been I, lazy we or just one busy? Today. Uh, yeah, so do we want to, I, I think we've done CES to death, but I'm interested about BlackBerry DevCon. You went all the way to Europe to see what life was left in your platform. That's true. <laughs> we have a, a new CEO, and uh, that was the first time he was going to be on stage. So, you know, that was history. I had to be there in the audience to witness firsthand. And I really liked him. He's a good guy. Complete, you know, very different from uh, Jim Balsilli and Mike Lazaridis, who, you know, as uh, you can't take any away, anything away from them. But having witnessed a lot of their presentations, I always felt a little awkward in the audience watching them. And uh, Thorsten Hines is good. He makes you feel comfortable. He's pretty low key. You know, he's not an over the top bomber. He's not a uh, slick talking executive like, uh, you know, Elop there. He's kind of like your father or something, right? He just wants to make you feel comfortable. Is he affable? Place trust in him. Yeah, he's good. You know, you, you believe him. Like he's, he, he's kind of the guy who says, yeah, this is a keynote presentation, but you know what? It's no big deal. We're kind of working through this thing together. Dude, like, he sounds like Arnold Schwarzenegger. How awesome is it to have a CEO that sounds like he could snap you in two? Considering Arnold's my hero, very exciting. Very happy about it. Kevin, we're going to revolutionize the BlackBerry <laughs> platform. <laughs> You won't no. <laughs> he's more calm than that, though. He's pretty, he's pretty calm. Uh, so you went in there a little bit trepidatious. I mean, it's been a tough year for RIM. They've had a lot of change. And what did you wait, see in DevCon? I don't even know what trepidatious means. Can you like, give me <laughs> words I understand? I mean, you are number if, one. I can't, if I can't spell it, I don't use it. You are, a, you are the number one BlackBerry fanboy. And the, the, the new CEO of RIM actually called you on launch day, on the CEO launch day. Uh, to check in with the Crackberry Nation. So, I mean, this is, this is well, a big so, thing for you as, as a people. So you got to remember, the way, the way that happened, he called in, not the same day, he called in, like, literally the, the minute the news became official. So it was immediate. Uh, but it wasn't so much like, I'm going to give Crackberry our first story or something like that. It was literally, I've been running a series of posts on the site. You know, basically, Kevin wants to be the new chairman of the board or CEO of, of RIM. And uh, he called to congratulate me, like two politicians running against each other and only one can win. He called to say, you know, I took the job and, you know, my takeaway was quit running those stories because it's annoying because I got the job now. So give me some time here. Uh, but it's pretty awesome. And then we followed up through the week and, and had a more in-depth interview. Uh, but yeah, totally different. I mean, that's five years of trying to get an interview with a RIM CEO and he took care of it in five seconds. I mean, it's a different attitude for the company. I know a lot of RIM employees, and they are all really excited. I mean, technically, nothing, nothing changed, right? You just changed the two guys at the top who, who most of the you know, thousands of employees didn't interact with directly. But it, it really has uh, changed the attitude of the company. And I think you're going to see a new RIM going forward, um, you know, filling up on all the gaps they have historically had in the past. And I think you know, one of those big things on the PR and marketing side is starting to really try to build a relationship with consumers, with tech media, with Wall Street, you know, they, they're an enterprise security problem uh, company at the core. And that's a problem, right? You know, one of, the, one of the... It's not sexy. Yeah, I mean, and this is something maybe we'll talk about later, but I was on the Engadget Mobile podcast uh, recently, and we had a great time. You know, we went really kind of toe-to-toe, and I was playing BlackBerry Defender, and, and you know, the Engadget Mobile crew was, was playing BlackBerry Hater. And, uh, that's you know, actually job. Yeah, that's yeah, <laughs> Phil's job. They, they we, weren't playing, Kevin. <laughs> no, okay, they weren't playing. They just hated on hated on BlackBerry, which is understandable. And you know, one of the discussions we got into was, you know, I really blame RIM going back six, seven years ago when they entered the consumer market for not doing a good job of building a cons- any any consumer loyalty to the company at that point. You know, so they built they started selling products to consumers, but when those products lagged behind, 
there's nothing there in terms of a relationship to have people want to see the company turn it around. It becomes this like just slash and burn, you're, you're done and, and be gone. But then if we think about companies like Palm, you know, mm. Derek, I mean, Palm's going down the hill, right? You guys are the, 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 you know, a product comes out that has good potential, but it's just not getting traction. The revenue's not there, going bankrupt, getting acquired. But all of the blog posts from all the major tech blogs, the media, from everybody is like, yeah, Palm's screwed. But man, we're really cheering. We really want to see them pull us off. We're really rooting for them. You know, we want to see them mm -hmm. pull it off. There was love for the company. Oh, yeah. and, and Rim was the opposite. There was a like for F the product Rim. when they were doing well, but there was no love. So nobody has a problem saying, well, you know, to hell with Rim. Let's see them go. And, and that's a mistake they made years ago. And I think, you know, we have... I have some editorials coming on, on, on the site to sort of put out there my take of how they can start fixing that and building the relationship now. But well, I want to know is how is RIM going to like – Microsoft is, is at their heels for the number three spot. They're not slowing down. They're making beautiful hardware with Nokia. Phil, the Android locomotive is just mowing down everything. Apple's putting out <coughs> their two or three really well-selling products a year. How does, RIM get, how does RIM keep down the people who are below them and, and attack the people who are ahead of them? So there's a couple things there. I mean, I think, you know, again, the whole RIM discussion, you need to compartmentalize it geographically a little bit. Um, you know, global media and global finance are, are sort of based out of the U.S., which is kind of where RIM is doing visibly the worst right now. And a lot of people look at what they see and report on what they see, and they project how RIM's doing in the U.S. onto the rest of the world. So obviously RIM's products, I mean, need the upgrade. RIM is working on that. That's the transition of BlackBerry 10. But the big thing is outside of the U.S. and North America, the, the brand isn't damaged. Any, any article saying, oh, RIM's brand is broken, they're screwed, they need to do this, very myopic. That's people in the U.S. who are thinking about the U.S. and not thinking about the real story. You know, again, DevCon Europe, 2,000 people. They sold out weeks ago. The energy there was awesome. And it was awesome from everyone. You had your core, like BlackBerry developers, and they're probably the ones who are less energetic because – you know, some of them who made a lot of money off the old platform know that's in jeopardy moving ahead with BlackBerry 10. But then even the Android people and stuff who were there looking to look at, you know, how they could port their apps over with, for the app player and that kind of thing. They were meeting RIM and BlackBerry as a real opportunity here. You know, it wasn't, oh, BlackBerry's done. It was respect for the brand. And they liked the brand of the company. Is that a problem that it's still RIM and BlackBerry, not just BlackBerry? Uh, you know, I put up an editorial to that point, and I think it could help cl clean up the message and build some more love for the company if BlackBerry was just BlackBerry, not, you know, BlackBerry made by RIM. Um, I don't know if you could say that's the problem, but I think there's there's something to that a little bit. Because Phil has that in spades. I mean, he has the Google Android operating system running on an HTC Verizon phone that has one of five different names. And, and hey, it goes back to Windows Mobile even, right, where you'd have product successes, you know, the Samsung Blackjack or the, or the Motorola Q. But there was no real love for Windows Mobile there, right? It was like individual products that were hot for a couple months and then they died and that was it. It never built up a bigger brand. I think the BlackBerry brand is strong though, but, but that's strong for the products, not necessarily for the people who make them. And you think about, you know, think about Apple, right, Renee, and everything they did. You know, Apple went through its hard times, but there was always that, you know, love for the company and the people and for jobs. And um, bleeding in six shape, bleeding in six yeah. colors. And I think RIM, that separation makes it a little, you know, and given their history too. I mean, one of the things that, uh, you know, I asked Torsten Hines about during that interview, which, which I actually, I don't think I put this part of it up, was, you know, I said, do you think RIM's lack of consumer engagement and dialogue in the past hurt you guys? And, and he answered it twofold. He said, you know, I think in the U.S., yes, we could have done better. And the reason there was that RIM had this longstanding history in enterprise, you know, security company. That was the face of the company and the product for a long time. It's not just the product, but the company also. And and they kind of accidentally ended up in, in consumer. You know, it wasn't an accident, but it wasn't something they were wanted to do, you know, uh, that they were very much demanded to do by carriers, by market demand. There was a, there was a need that wasn't being met by, uh, you know, Android didn't exist yet, and neither did Apple with iPhones. So they kind of came in and they had uh, arguably – better positioned product for consumers than uh, Windows Mobile or, or Palm at the time. And, and they rose to the top without really trying, you know, just by selling and pumping out iterations of the same thing. Uh, not even a consumer device, you know, it was an enterprise device that they threw the name Pearl and Curve on and, and left it as an enterprise OS. 
I guess I have uh, a question for Phil that kind of spins off of this. Um, <clears throat> Phil, Android is is maybe the most carrier friendly operating system. I mean, you as a carrier, you can do almost anything you want with it. Um, they have to sell Apple because people they have to sell Apple. But with everyone else, it seems like it's going to be a struggle uh, to get your platform there, and you're always going to be competing with their installed base of Android now. It, are the platforms like like uh, Windows Phone and BlackBerry going to have a chance against something like Android? Android is the new Windows Mobile, and I've been saying that for a long time, and I think Dan will back me up there. I mean, it, it's an yeah. embedded OS. You can do whatever the hell you want with it. And we're starting to see some really good stuff, whereas Microsoft never quite got that same sort of traction. Uh, but, yeah, it's it's the new <coughs> Windows Mobile it's because carriers can take it and do whatever they want with it. And, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. I, l- I love the idea of that. I think it's a really good idea. I think it's really easy and far too tempting for the carriers to screw up and for the manufacturers to maybe go a little overboard, especially now with what you're seeing, you know, Google do so well with, with ice cream sandwich. Of course, nobody has ice cream sandwich. You know, 1% of all, uh, you're a one percenter, Phil. So, 1% of all Android devices that, that, uh, ping the store in the past two weeks, you know, use ice cream sandwich. So it's not a lot. So, Renee, to your question, though, about, you know, fighting for third in, in a, you know, Microsoft and Windows Phone and BlackBerry fighting for third position, I think that point opens the opportunity for BlackBerry because, you know, with Android, you're going to have huge volume, but you're not going to have necessarily individual products that get a massive amount of volume, you know, so that the hero devices like the Galaxy Nexus and that will do big volume worldwide. But after that, you get this fragmentation between carrier exclusives and you know, phones that have a three-month life cycle instead of a 12-month life cycle. So what I would say yeah, is, you know... You, you, go ahead. you say that, but what are they going to do it with? I don't know. So say something like a black, the first BlackBerry 10 phone comes out. That's going to be a global rollout of that phone Wait. across carriers worldwide. The volume of that single phone... So, so Android's going to have way bigger market share. But the volume and presence in the marketplace globally of that single phone that RIM will do first is probably going to be... You know, let's say after the iPhone, I wouldn't doubt if you can position the BlackBerry 10 phone as the next highest volume device, more than the Android or Windows phone, because Windows phone is also the new Windows mobile. We have lots of fragmentation between the individual products happening. Where do I going to see a lot the first? of fragmentation? <laughs> I mean, right now, we only see? have like maybe eight major devices on the market, and that's pushing in. Right now, Nokia is really stealing a lot of that market share. Uh, especially in Europe right now. And they're just kind of doing the same thing with their Lumia line, uh, the 710, 800, 900, just sort of iterations, uh, variations of the same device. So we're not really quite Windows Mobile, sure. and I don't think we ever will be. Um, there's just too much restriction on the, the hardware. But you're for, still trying uh, to have everything. You, you want differentiation, but you want a few major hero devices. You're like right in the middle of Android and Apple. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, totally right in the middle. Yeah. Phil, you were going to retort? Well, I mean, we say, you know, the next iteration of BlackBerry can do this, and but it's not going to do it for another eight months. Yeah, does the, the timing, you know what, the timing doesn't matter right now. It, it, what matters is that they put out a good product. If they, had, if they put it out today, I can tell you what the reviews would say. They'd say, great hardware, we love the UI out of the box. Some of the major apps are here, but not enough of them. I don't see the reason why I would invest in this platform over Android or iOS. It'd be a playbook. So, well, and that's exactly and what they're going to be. It would be better than, right? than a playbook deal. But that's why they need this extra time, pushing to the end of the year, to fill out that mother freaking ecosystem at whatever cost, which is kind of what Microsoft and Windows Mobile are doing too right now, or Windows Phone are doing, buying, buying lots of apps onto the platform. And, and that's the key. But you know, if it takes a little longer right now, it doesn't matter because they, they still have a revenue engine keeping the company alive in the meantime. So, we, we saw Kayak say you know, in the past week, that's it, we're dropping BlackBerry, not doing yeah. it. Kayak sucks. Get BlackBerry Travel. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. No, that's what that's what every comment said. It's like, who the heck cares about a Kayak app? It's you know, it was it was nothing. Now, arguably, they should have an awesome app, and that should be the case. But in the meantime, users aren't hurting. But you said that too, Phil, right? Like you said, it wouldn't be bad if there were fewer Android devices that were like, like more important and lasted longer. Uh, I think mean, yeah, HTC maybe. might have said that. Too. <laughs> I, I look don't at it know. from. It's- Look at the benefit from the third-party ecosystem thing. So you look at, say, like, look at accessories, right, is a great example with iOS. Mm-hmm. If I'm OtterBox or Incipio or somebody and a new iPad or a new iPhone comes out, I am going to invest in it because I know there's 12 months at least there before, you know, for my molds and my designs to invest in inventory, to invest in scale, to get my distribution out there and really, really bet on it and, and give consumers lots of options. 
With Android devices, you're seeing companies get burned because you know your OtterBox or Incipio, you think this is going to be the latest and greatest phone according to Android Central, uh, but then Verizon like gives it an end of life three months later. So, so you you don't know who to bet on, right? You bet on the big ones, you know, the Galaxy mm-hmm. Nexus and Hero phones, but you're never getting this big life cycle. One so my, it, it it works in Apple's advantage for third parties to 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 embrace iOS. One of my favorite stories from CES: Derek and I were walking through the iLounge Pavilion, and we saw this really interesting lens for the iPhone. Well, actually, it was just a lens, and the, in order to fit it onto the iPhone, they made a case. They made one for the 3G, 3GS, and one for the 4 and 4S. So two cases, lens attachment. They had tried making several cases for Android, but they just they couldn't keep up. So their solution was uh, an elastic band. <laughs> and I mean, it sounds funny, but this is what they f- they thought would maximize their value in terms of processing molds and creating components. Um, and it, Windows kind of <coughs> does it differently, Dan. Right? Like you have variation, but you still have several set chassis. Yeah, although I would say the accessory market has been very very lagging behind Windows Phone right now, partly because the market share just hasn't caught up. So uh, a lot of these companies haven't seen uh, incentive to invest yet into making these accessories. And I think that's one thing. Um, you know, RIM has a real uphill battle here. Sure, they have their brand name. Sure, they have some capital. They have um, a lot working for them, but so did not Microsoft. I, I mean, I would argue Microsoft was in a better position, has more of an ecosystem, uh, better partners, more options. They have everything better than REM, and they're still having a very difficult time and making headway into this market, which doesn't really give me much confidence that REM is actually going to have uh, an easy time doing this and trying to be a fourth player. We've always heard Kerry say that they want three players, and that was kind of going to be between the third position, it's going to be between Windows Phone and REM, but uh, I'm not really sure there's room for a fourth. And so you know- it's going to be real difficult, I think, for this to, uh, to actually happen. There's a great question in the chat room. Maybe this will help Kevin address it. Uh, some people in the chat room are saying that phones, smartphones are still communication devices first. We're doing the Mobile Nations Fitness Challenge this month. We're showing how amazing they are for e-health and e-fitness or eye health and eye fitness. Uh, Derek did a ton of great automotive stuff for us at CES. You're using your phone to control your car. They're becoming everyday devices, but are they still primarily communication devices? And is that still RIM's sort of ace in the hole? Well, I think with the current BlackBerry 7 phones, that's how you're you're still trying to sell them within most markets, right? It's a great messaging device and a little bit more. It's not yet what we call, you know, the mobile ex- computing experience that's now expected and you know with the mobile games and everything else, big touchscreen displays. Um, but yeah, there's still there's still a core. I mean, the, the other thing that here's here's the thing that I get floored at. We're still talking about the smartphone market, right? And we're like, "Oh, you know, RIM was number 1 and now they're lagging behind the growth of Android in the smartphone market." But honestly, in another year or two, the term smartphone is dead. Every phone is a smartphone. And now we're talking about not a few hundred million devices. We're talking about like a couple billion devices globally. And to think that a company like RIM, who controls the end-to-end platform, can build awesome hardware, a custom UI experience, fill out their app gap, can't make a sustainable business in that, I think is just kind of bollocks now. Is that like what I think, Nokia said, though? Yeah, but they, they run the, the wrong end of it on the feature phone side. Right. Still, still communications device primarily? Or? I, I think there's room for Windows Phone too. The other thing is carrier relationships. So, you know, to Dan's point about Microsoft versus RIM. So RIM is not so big that they can boss carriers around like uh, Apple can and maybe Google can and do what they want. RIM grew to be a big successful company in the past decade by giving carriers what they want, working with carriers. And and that's their, their ace in the hole right now to come back still is... Carriers are getting relegated to a dumb pipe, and they need good competition for these guys so they can work with. And I think RIM's a company that'll work with carriers, maybe more so even than Microsoft. I haven't heard from Derek enough yet today. Derek, primarily communication yeah. devices. Now that you can sort of look at this with a detached outsider's perspective, uh, how do you make sense of the market? I, I think it's still a, uh, a communications device. Nine, even with all the apps and everything we do, it's still communicating with other people. Uh, we're going we're gonna to get more and more being able to control your TV and your home automation system and access your car. But 90% of what you do with this is going to be to communicate with other people, be it with phone or, or with a phone call or text message or over Twitter and Facebook or Path or whatever the next social extravaganza is. It's going to be a communication device. Uh, it's just spreading out into more forms of that communication. I get angry when my phone rings. I'm busy playing a game or writing something <laughs> or doing something, the phone rings, and it's so, it's, it scares me and it disturbs me. 
I don't expect it anymore. <laughs> Have they fixed that thing about um, it? The, when I'm on a phone call on an iPhone, does it still like buzz when an email comes in? I haven't noticed lately. I don't know if they actually fixed it or just notifications are better now and you can control it that it doesn't do it. it drives me nuts. Can't do it. Phil, what do you think? Communications are still a priority or are you seeing much more diversity now? Well, I mean, of course they are, right? I mean, if only because everybody uses email all the time, you know, texting and, and social networking. I mean, you, anybody who says you're not using your phone for communication is ridiculous. Um, there's a lot more, and I don't want to call it introspection, but I mean, there's a lot more of just somebody looking head, you know, head down, playing with their phone and not necessarily talking directly to, to somebody. But no, I mean, it's, you, you still hear about people doing hundreds and hundreds of texts a month. My wife actually went over her uh, text allotment and I had to up it. But do people, when the people are asking you to recommend which Android phone should I get, do, do people actually care how good a phone it is anymore? Or is it screen size, LTE, gaming, all the other stuff? They just want to know what the best phone is. And that's why uh, two weeks ago we, we kind of restarted our list. Or here are the best phones that we think are on the, you know, this carrier at, at any given time. Or, the, or you know, however, Canada and Europe. And actually we borrowed Australia too. Um, you know, no, specs are not – specs are important, right? I don't want to get into that. Specs are important, but specs are not the be-all and all. You need to look at the entire phone, the entire package. And this phone is good. In fact, we kind of didn't really explain why. Um, you know, you should go read the reviews. You should do all that. Read our reviews. Read other people's reviews. Read ours first and last, <laughs> though, because they're the best. But, no, first I mean, and last. <laughs> screen size is important insofar as, you know, is it a Galaxy Note with a 5.3-inch screen or is it something wow. with a 4-inch screen, which is also really good? Or is it something with a, you know, 3.5-inch screen, which you still occasionally see? That matters, but it doesn't necessarily mean one is better than the other. Dan, because we did that interview with Joe Belfiore at, at Microsoft, and we asked tons of questions about the build of the phone, the design of the phone, Windows Phone 7, the interface. I don't think anyone ever mentioned how good an actual phone call it made. I think they, like, the new future seems to ignore the actual phone functionality. Uh, yeah, and we try to, in our reviews, always do that little section like, oh, yeah, and it makes phone calls. Because uh, it's true that even I barely use my phone for actual phone calls anymore. It's mostly for texting, IMing web surfing, email, uh, basically any sort of uh, thing that requires a text input, I use more, much more frequently. And so we do try to cover that. Uh, Windows Phone's phone system is actually really basic, and I mean that in a good way. In a sense, it has a big number dialer, and it's just your basic functions. You have some of HTC does there, still their tricks where you put the phone down face first. It automatically will switch to speakerphone, which is kind of nice. Or while it's in your pocket, it uses the light sensor to detect uh, darkness, and so it'll ring louder. And then when you pull it out, it senses movement. The ringer quiets. So they do uh, the smart stuff. But I mean, Windows Phone actually does work well as a phone. And reception has always been, you know, an issue. But uh, on these devices, we've so far had uh, very little complaints in regards to that. That's so. the heartbreak I sense in Kevin is that RIM always cared about the the efficiency, the network, the bandwidth it was using, and they wanted to make really, <coughs> really amazing phones. And it, like people just don't even care about the phone anymore, Kevin. That's probably why Mike Lazarita stepped down. He's like, I can't take these dumb consumers who don't understand efficiency and battery life and physics and spectrum. They don't <laughs> care. Yeah, they just want to know. Yeah, they don't, they don't, they don't understand. They just don't care. It doesn't no. matter uh, yeah. to yeah. them how efficient it is with their data because you know you're practically forced into getting a two gigabyte data package these days. You can get a five hundred megabyte package. Well, that's worthless. Uh, so you know they're going to get a two gigabyte package and they're probably not going to go over a gigabyte. So this data efficiency, uh, it really only matters with regards to battery life and. Most people have been conditioned to where they bring their phone home and they plug it in when they go to bed. Or they make a five-inch phone like, like uh, Samsung now yeah. for the giant battery in it. True. I'll tell you, it's, it, it's funny. I've got a grandfathered uh, unlimited account on AT&T, and I'm waiting to get the dreaded, you're being throttled. Yeah, text explain that. Talk that about that because that's everywhere now. Okay, so I've got the old school. It's $30 uh, for unlimited data, which now that I think about it, it's actually really good, right? Mm -hmm. Except that AT&T has decided that they want to get people off unlimited data and fine I, I get that I understand uh, so they have different buckets they have a 2 gigabyte 3 gigabyte and a 5 gigabyte plan the 5 gigs is uh, 50 bucks plus you get tethering so it's actually not horrible uh, so right now I'm on unlimited and basically if you hit 2 gigabytes they will consider you to be in the top 5% of unlimited users 
in which case they will start slowing down your data. They won't cut it off, but they'll throttle you. They'll slow it for the rest of the month. Like down to edge uh, speed sometimes. Yeah, I mean, under the guise of getting you to switch to one of these you know, tiered plans. And so it was funny. I actually went back and, and looked at uh, my data usage in the past couple months. Now, remember, I sit here at home, right? I mean, I, I work at a desk all day with Wi-Fi. But uh, how much data do you guys think I use? Uh, 800 bags. Six. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm at like a gig, maybe. Yeah. Uh, th- now, that was before. That was before I went out and started walking as part of Mobile Nation's fitness month, which, of course, <laughs> I haven't done. You <laughs> look so skinny, Phil. Yeah, I know. You look so young. Eh, not so much. Um, <laughs> a young Jim Belushi now. <laughs> so that's, that's up to a good little bit. And it's been interesting <laughs> to see what uses more data, whether it's Google Music or uh, what else was I? I was using the Sirius app. Uh, so I've been paying attention to that. But I don't use nearly as much data as I thought I did. We have a lot of heavy data users on iMore who people have been hitting six six gigs plus every month, and they're getting the message, and they're kind of angry because uh, it's like they're trying to be forced off of the unlimited connection, but there's no reward for doing it. It's like AT&T is not saying, look, guys, we want to get you off unlimited. We'll throw in free tethering or an extra gig of data or just They screwed something. up the message. Yes. Real, I mean, they could have done it so much better than they did, and I understand why they're doing it. I get that. But, I mean, instead of going positive, they went negative, and it's like, Really? Really? Okay. So we have so. people now just leaving their phones on streaming all day. Like, I don't care if it goes to edge. I'm going to exact every megawatt of juice out of this thing that I can. Yeah, I, these, these people, they're on a plan. They're out of a contract now on these plans. Right. They're doing the month-to-month deal. They could, AT&T could very easily say, all right, in one year we're turning off unlimited data. You're going to have to pick a different plan, period. Yeah, if and, not, and we're that's gonna, the boat I'm in. Yeah, if, if they did that... And said, we're going to give you one year. We're not going to throttle you or anything, but in one year, we're going to switch you to the plan that costs, thir- costs the same amount. We're going to switch you to the three gigabyte plan. Or you can switch to something else if you want. But unlimited data is going away in this time period. In the meantime, continue to use it as you like because you're going to lose it. But you know this whole, we want to force you off of it and encourage you to switch. So we're going to throttle you down. That's bad consumer messaging yeah and it's not going to resonate with your power influence users who you want to be hot you know to be really champion your network there are everybody's already down on at&t anyway i just want to use my phone as a phone exactly <laughs> although it, i mean we had challenges at ces with at&t i was swapping between at&t and t-mobile changing between buildings but they held up at Macworld at Moscone, like a champion, and did it 3G the whole time. I mean, they are making steady improvements. I don't know how much the limited... Do we have any sense of how large the limited grandfathered un- audience is still? I, I imagine it's not that large. Like it's not taking any towers down. It's just It just seems like such a waste. Kevin's doing his part with three kilobits of data every month on his white bowls. It's so true. <laughs> so beautiful. Just such a gorgeous phone. So, Although I mean, I, I, go ahead. I was going to say, Valentine's Day is tomorrow, and I'm, I'm hoping I get a P9981. Nice. Is, is that on Mrs. Crackberry's shopping list? Well, it's on somebody's shopping <laughs> list. That's a sexy name for a phone. What is it? Oh, a P9. What is that? A P, a P, P apostrophe. P99. Yeah, P apostrophe 9981. Is that pr- so. pronounced P9? P9. P9000. The P9. It's P9, a phone yeah. that made the Epic 3, 3, 4G not sound as bad. <laughs> Um, so I, I guess one of the other issues, and I'd like some of your, your takes on this that we had this week, was the manufacturing processes behind the companies that we all use and love. For example, all these factories in China making all these phones, are the Apples in the world, are the Motorola's, are the companies that use these factories responsible for the working conditions in those factories, or are they just being used as a tool to get a lot of attention and a lot of headlines? If, Kevin, you, haven't, if you haven't listened to that NPR uh uh, not NPR. Who was it? It was a uh, This American Life interview with uh, Mike Daisy. You, you have to go listen to that. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, you know, it, it pains me to hear these things, but that's that's modern capitalism. That's how it works. I America was in this same position 150 years ago. We were evolving into a manufacturing society and we had to go through these same growing pains. Five years uh, but it's, was working the mines. Exactly. There, uh, 
there's no real other option. People are they went to China to satisfy the pricing demands of the American consumer and also to satisfy the flexibility and capacity demands of the manufacturer. They can't bring this stuff to America. And they also, you know, they can I would, I would actually they, yeah, I would I would phrase it a little differently. I think it was they're driven by profit. I mean, ultimately, right, but this is they're not necessarily driven by profit uh, because they sat down and they should be. The numbers. That's a job the, of a corporation. <laughs> no, I'm saying the motivation behind using Chinese labor is not behind profit. The sure it is uh, between an iPhone or an iPhone manufactured in the United States and an iPhone manufactured in China, the cost difference labor wise is like five dollars. Now, granted, across. 30 million devices that can add up, but it's $5 per device. What, why they go to China is for the uh, manufacturing synergies. Everything happens in China. They All cut the, the glass in China. They, there. Hmm? All the other manufacturers are there. Exactly. All the manufacturers that make all the other subcomponents that go into this device are there. And they're not just in China. They're 15 miles away. Uh, and they have a workforce that is not – they're willing to work for these wages, and they consider these to be good wages, and they're willing to live on site at the factory and work 12, 14 hours a day. I, and well, you can't I mean, get that anywhere else. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, we, we need to praise that a little carefully. I'm not sure. I mean, I don't want to be apologist for this either. I mean, they, no, one, no one wants to work 14 hours a day. They're not doing it gleefully. They're doing it because they don't have a little choice. It, it beats uh, the now, alternative you can make the argument that it's better than... Yes not having a job and not being able to sustain themselves. But still, uh, no one wants to, in this world, work 14, 20 hours a day. They have a high suicide rate there for a reason. Uh, people aren't happy, but they have little choice. Now, I do find the discussion a little strange, too. I think it's weird asking corporations to be kinder or gentler. Um, corporations are amoral characters in this planet. They don't have, they're not good or bad. They're just driven by profit and that's their only motivation. They're basically psychopaths. I mean, they don't <laughs> do good or bad. They're just driven by a they certain just do. goal. Yeah. And so to ask them to be nice and do this, it's, uh, it's going against their very nature. So if people really want to change the dynamic of how this all works, you need to change the system itself and not have this sort of uh, what we have right now, but that's a much deeper and more sophisticated uh, discussion than just asking Apple or any of these other companies to play nice. Uh, it, we can the, do the that, but the, the situation is going to change itself in the next decade or two. Anyway, we are by man outsourcing all of this manufacturing to China. We are slowly dragging China and its its citizens and consumers up to the first world level of Europe and United States and Canada. We're, we're, their wages are what, like 10 times higher than they were 15 years ago. Their standard of living is going up. There's actually manufacturing coming back to the United States for less complicated things because it costs less to do it here now than it did to do it there. We has In time, plus. that manufacturing is going to slowly trickle out of China either back to the United States or into Eastern Europe or Indonesia and Singapore. And that's just how the cycle goes. So the question is, where does it go after that? So here's another question. Some of the readers on iMore brought up the idea of you have fair trade coffee, and they, they believe in fair trade gadgetry. So they'll actually research the companies. For example, an LG that manufactures in Korea or a company that manufactures in Taiwan, uh, as opposed to a company that manufactures in China. Phil, you have a wide range of, people, <coughs> of uh, choices on your platform. Does that become a strength then if people want to sort of flex their ethical muscles? Look... I mean, none of this is new. H Dan, you remember back in the old days when we talked about whether you know a, a trio was made at Foxconn or, or somewhere right. else? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and there were manufacturing differences back then. Uh, the, the difference now is people know what it is and and know what goes on there. But, I mean, it's it's not a new problem. It's not going to get solved anytime soon. But the if New York it, Times it, ran an expose, Phil. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, I mean, how it's really going to change is is a company like Apple or like HP or somebody who's really pumping the money in there to say, "Here's how we want it done," and we're willing to give you a little more money, or we're willing to take our business elsewhere. That's what it's going to take. Yeah, and I think that's an important point, only because we can talk about the conditions, everything that's going on, but we should also be clear here that. In China, they do have labor laws, and those labor laws were drafted and based a lot of times on what the United States has and other uh, European countries. But these labor laws are actually being ignored 
by these companies. And so, you know, the idea of working 14, 18 hours a day, we can be like, well, it's good or bad. But the fact is, it's actually illegal for a lot of them to be doing that. And so companies like Apple um, and other, you know, they don't own these companies, but they're contracted work. And so they do have influence to make sure that at least the, the local laws are being observed and followed. And I think that's an interesting uh, point here, that these companies could leverage their power to do that, but they're kind of not doing it. And so, you know, that's a, that's a sticky issue. I think that really does need to be addressed. Kevin, it's also sort of, important to note, I think, that 99% of the people writing about this stuff probably don't know what the hell they're talking about. It's a headline. I, mean, I, I think unless you've been there, unless you're inside the companies that are, that are putting money into China like that, I mean, you, you really just don't know. But it's, it's a headline, Phil. Putting, putting Apple it's a the great headline. headline. Putting Britney Spears <laughs> in the headline now. It's like, it's like sure. tabloid almost. I get that, but, you know. Kevin, you're my, you're my big business guy. Is, is this something that the companies should concern themselves about? Do they have a, a, a duty to be ethical world citizens, or is their duty just merely to see to the value of their shareholders? Well, that is the, the corporate line for capitalism, right? Is duty is, public company, your duty is to your shareholders to return profits. But I think these days, good business means being good corporate citizens of the world. And it is very much one world we live in now. Uh, so I think regardless of where factories are, you know, the companies do have a, a, a duty to make sure good things are going on that are that are proper and normal. I know one of the thing with um, you know Apple stories in the past, right, where it's like oh, a worker commits suicide, that kind of thing. Yeah. I'm pretty sure if you look at those statistics and you just look at the fact that there's like 150,000 people there. Uh, if you just take 150,000 people at random anywhere on the planet, you're probably going to have a few who commit suicide. There's a high suicide, suicide, suicide rate, rate at Foxconn. Game of numbers, actually, right? Yeah. yeah the suicide rate at Foxconn is actually lower than that of China at a whole. Yeah. yeah. So then, so then you can't really, you know, headlines come into play for sure, more yeah. so than anything wrong. And, and I think these companies well, these days, I mean, yeah. Well, that's business. because, yeah, but I understand, it's because they live at work. <laughs> I mean, it's, so they, have they have factory towns. You know, they, have, they live in dormitories, and they're at work 24-7. Uh, it's a, so it does resonate differently, because if you spent 24-7 at your job, and you that sounds yourself. great to me. That sounds like <laughs> university. You're a blogger, sure. Yeah, okay. But I guarantee that's... every night when they are when after they're done their 14 hours of work, the next 10 hours is picking up chicks, going back to each other's rooms. This is what's yeah. going. They're probably happier yeah, than yeah, everybody. I'm sure that's. I'm sure that's exactly what's happening. <laughs> I think mobile yeah. nations needs to go on a little road trip here and get into some Chinese factories. I think Dan's about have. to organize uh, Occupy Kevin. Kevin yeah. at <laughs> mobilenations.com. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, so I, I'm just saying that, like, uh, I mean, so it's a difference. When someone commits suicide at home, it could be all sorts of reasons. It could be personal, financial, it could be their job. But when someone is at their job 24 7, it's a factory town that they live in, their whole life is work, uh, and they commit suicide, you could kind of infer They still that. have lives outside of work. And a lot of these yeah, people they, that they go there, they go to their family. So it could still be work, personal, financial. They're. Just they have a chemical imbalance in their brain that's not working right. There are all sorts of things that can still drive people to suicide. I mean, people, where I'm, I'm in the this is far uh, too heated a discussion for a multi. I'm, I'm in the National Guard. And <laughs> it's the best discussion. There's ever. a lot of uh, concern right now over the suicide rate in the United States military. But all these people committing suicide, they aren't necessarily committing suicide because they're stressed out by being in the army. They run into personal problems. They run into financial problems. And sometimes this stuff is, you know, we're getting into a very philosophical question here, but just because you live at work, like people do in the military, doesn't mean that you, your suicide is directly related to that work. So I have a, another controversy <laughs> for us to jump right into from this one, from the frying pan to the fire. Um, it, it's been mostly in the headlines for Android and iOS lately, but as our phones become more important to us, the privacy governing those phones is becoming more important to us. We saw this um, in iOS this week when Path was, I guess, caught not the right word because a lot of applications were doing it. They just got noticed first. They were basically uploading your entire contact sheet to their servers in order to be able to alert you when your friends were there. And two years ago, Nuance got caught doing the same thing so that when they did dictation, they could recognize the name of your friends. But there's nothing in iOS to ask for permission for this, so we don't know if any application is doing this. Uh, and Phil and I were talking about how the Android market presents permissions very differently. But the challenge here 
is I don't want to launch an app and say, do I have permission to access your Twitter? Yes. Your push notifications? Yes. Your location? Yes. Your contacts? Yes. I'll stop reading. I'll start hitting that thing really fast. If I have a long list of things, I'll stop reading it and just hit the button fast. Jerry, Phil, was saying how you know it's your responsibility. At the end of the day, as long as they advise you, you take responsibility for that. But how do we balance informing consumers who are new to smartphones about the power and privacy implications of these devices? We write, and we write, and we talk, and we write. Um, it's, it, it's, it's a slippery thing, right? Because, like you said, if you see it every time, you're going to start ignoring it. I don't read Android app permissions when I install a new app. I just don't. I should. I don't. But the fact that they're there means the onus is on me. Mm -hmm. You know, period. If I don't read them, that's my fault. Um, now, the, that said, it, you know, the application needs to properly declare the permissions that it's using. And if it doesn't, then we have issues. Uh, Does the platform know, have a duty to force the application to do that? I don't think it has a, an obligation to. I, th I think it should. And I think when you're considering a mobile platform, then that's something you should take into consideration, perhaps. Um, I mean, look, for me personally, my thing is the moment I pick up this phone, this needs to know about me. This needs to know about what I do, and I, I give up a certain expectation of privacy when I use this, just the way it is. You know, if I don't like it, I don't have to use it. Um, is that a little Pollyanna? Is that kind of <laughs> taking developers off the hook? Maybe a little bit. Uh, I, I absolutely think you know developers have an obligation to uh, keep my information private. I don't think Path did anything horribly wrong. Well, they didn't um, I think even Mike... hashtag the contact, so it was being transmitted in clear text, which we weren't very happy okay. about. I have, I have yeah, something yeah, but it did say. it over SSL. So, I mean, and, and even if it did, what's the likelihood it, they they send that stuff up once? And what's the likelihood of somebody's monitoring your yeah. data usage, waiting to just glean your contact? You see that truck outside your window, Derek? Do you see that truck? Yeah, I, I'm really not worried about it. If you haven't read Michael Arrington's. Uh, retort on all this you really should because you know people are uh, i mean like you said they're they're catching these companies in the act yeah right? <gasps> you, what, what, what in the scheme of things are, are rather you know stupid and basic mistakes i don't yeah. think the world is quite as nefarious as we like to believe for the five minutes that we're yelling at these people well then and honestly i think this whole you know with path and some other ios apps uh, with the uh, address book. It was just it was an oversight on Apple's part. For whatever reason, yeah. they decided not to include you know the requirement that if you're going to upload this user's contact data to the server, you have to ask. And developers are busy developing apps. They they're more focused on the user experience. So if they don't have to run this by the user and say, oh, we can just do that automatically. Yeah, they're going to do that. I mean, that's, their their focus is on but... making a good experience. They don't care about having this mass <coughs> of Data they, they kind of should. I don't know. This thing with Apple, though, I mean, Apple's been around now for a couple of years. This isn't like something new. Windows Phone does have this system where you have to have permissions uh, as well, and uh, uploading contacts is that. one of those. And so uh, you do have to, to agree that? to stuff. And all these apps also have options to enable or disable that. And I think that's an important thing, too. If you want to share your location. Oh, I, I agree. Or, it's important. But I think it's, it was an oversight. And I uh, imagine it was an oversight, but one comes out, Apple's going to fix it and say, my bad. <laughs> yeah. OK. I'm, I'm just saying that it's an oversight that, you know, it's a couple of years old. You know, I understand if there are new, you know, it's only a year or two. But I mean, that's I'm, it's sort of surprising that it's been an oversight. For they should have caught long. it before now. Yeah, yeah, that's all I'm saying. You know, it's like it, it well, you know, this it, it's protecting like user they, they information is important. They, they didn't uh, notice that you know, the iPhone was not clearing out the location cache. So technically, if you got one, you could track down where they people They didn't had notice been. that we couldn't cut and paste for three years. I mean, priorities, yeah. people. <laughs> right. I, they, they have their, their things that they're really working on. You know, it, they're focused on doing stuff like Siri and figuring out how to multitask like Palm OS that <laughs> they don't notice things necessary like oh this file is logging but that was things the other part of my question is you can't yeah. just endlessly present permissions to users either because too much is the same as too little you have you've got to find a, a way of making this stuff digestible kevin do we just carry a smartphone in one pocket and a dumb phone burner in the other pocket now is that maybe, the, maybe I, when maybe. i go to china <laughs> so so here's my question on all of this is let's compare mobile to other industries right so let's say our car you know we get into our cars we basically trust that the company that built that car 
has done so in a manner that's safe for us, right? That gets no. us from point A to point B, but for the most part. But, well, what but I'm it's all because is, of government regulation. <laughs> well, okay, that's what I'm saying. So there's a Department of yeah. Transportation that ensures okay. industry follows some certain things for the end user to get a good experience. You know, I just flew to Amsterdam and back. Do I trust the individual companies sometimes? I don't know, but I'm trusting there's somebody out there looking after the greater good so that when I get on an airplane, I'm, I'm pretty certain I'm going to make it there, right? Shit happens, but pretty certain. So in mobile, who is that organization right now? Us. Yep. Mobile yeah. Nations. So, so is this the, should there be some sort of a global mobile <laughs> for the interests of the best, you know, of the consumers who holds these companies accountable? Because right now, there's no real ramifications. If well, I, there's so many facets else. to this. I, with a car, there are there are, there are multiple organizations that regulate cars. There is uh, the NTSB that regulates things. safety. The EPA regulates emissions. Sure, uh, um, I, the FCC is having too. to get into it now with cars having embedded uh, wireless connectivity. With phones, we've got the FCC already taking care of the wireless part. The question is who's going to take care of consumer privacy? And that has almost always fallen on to like, consumer advocacy groups. But hasn't the FTC already said they're going to monitor Google and Facebook and Twitter for privacy for the next 20 years or something? Well, yeah, Google, as part of the whole Google Buzz thing, had to enter into an agreement with the FCC <coughs> or FTC and did it, I think, voluntarily, uh, where they're going to, you know, they have independent monitoring for the next 30 years. And mm -hmm. that's a good thing. And maybe all companies should do that. I don't know. I mean, in, at the end of the day, you know, you're going to vote with your wallet. If you don't trust in something, nobody's going to buy it. Um, but no, it, it, it's going to be up to the journalists and the blogs of the world to kind of, you know, keep everybody a little bit honest, I think. I, I think the majority of these smartphone companies, I don't think any of them are inherently evil. You I don't think back. Apple's out there saying, ooh, we can get everybody's contacts and, you know, and do whatever we want with them. I think they need to adjust their permissions a little bit and, and how they handle that. Um, I mean, look, Google already has most Android users' contacts anyway. I mean, actually, I don't know what the the uh, Gmail usage to non-Gmail is on Android devices would be an be interesting huge. statistic to see. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you figure it's huge, right? They already have my stuff. Now, they do a good job of making sure developers have to explicitly say, hey, we can access your contacts. And I'm not quite sure if it works differently wherein the application can go and call on those contacts or if they are separately uploaded in the case of iOS, right? Um, so maybe that makes a difference. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's going to be really, you know, journalists need to keep, it, it's called watchdog journalism, right? That's the way it's supposed to be. Uh, but yeah, independent groups, same thing. Watchdog groups, that's what they're called. Um, you know, and nothing wrong with that at all. So I wanted to, to kind of finish off today with a look ahead to 2012. Um, we have a big tablet battle brewing for the first time, really, because Microsoft is about to enter the game. Uh, they've been slow, but, you know, they, they, like Steve Ballmer says, they're relentless. They just keep coming. They just keep coming. They just keep coming. I've had a Microsoft tablet for about six years. Tablet PC does not count. We're doing, <laughs> we're doing a do-over <laughs> tablet PC that never existed. Uh, so let's just go around the room and see where we think. Because tablets, some people are saying they're going to eventually eclipse smartphones in terms of the importance to the average consumer. Uh, 2012, Kevin, where do you see the playbook and, and Rim's place in this battle? Well, you should have answered me last, question. right? Yeah, I, I mean, play, playbook, playbook one was just uh, an early beta for BlackBerry 10. Uh, OS 2 is coming out. It's going to get better, but it's not going to change the game at all. It'll be some volume. You know, I think, I think the 7-inch form factor playbook, ha some people love it. A lot of people love that size, but I think they need a really good 10-inch device to to you know, be in that game, and that won't be till very late this year. So that might be more of a 2013 thing. Phil, so oh, sorry, yeah. done. No, that's it. Done. Phil, ice cream sandwich, 2012. Is it is it going to be the popular tablet? Um, no, no. I mean, look, the iPad, the iPad is still the tablet to beat. Period. Uh, Android still has a big pricing structure. It needs to get out in front of. Um. ICS, yeah, I mean, an ICS tablet, what are we, halfway through February? Mm, no, no. iPad's still the big one. Does, does Android suffer with tablets because they don't have the same kind of carrier support that they would on a phone? And carriers have been really big champions of Android? 
No, I mean, look, you walk into a Verizon store and you, what are you going to buy? You're going to buy an iPad. You're going to buy, you know, the horribly named Droid Zyborg. You know, start <laughs> with that. Best John Claude Van Damme movie of the oh 80s by far. God. Start with that, right? Let's name it something you actually want to buy and not something you're afraid is going to attack you while you sleep. Um, it's really um, Android on tablets just hasn't quite gotten there yet. I think it's as close as it's been right now to being a fully usable and, and friendly operating system. Um, I, I think <coughs> the manufacturers need to take what they've tried to do with phones and do it with tablets. I've said it before in the Android Central podcast where you have something like the Kindle Fire that actually has a solid use case. Like you, you buy this, you know what you're supposed to do with it. Right? You go to Amazon, you buy stuff. You go to Amazon, you get books, you read the books, you watch the movies. You know what you're supposed to do. With the iPad, you look at it and you know you've got apps and you know what the apps do. Android's still not quite as mature on that on the uh, tablet front. It's does, not to say there's not stuff to do with it, but it's Google just need, not as uh, friendly. Does Google need a Nexus tablet before the Amazons and the Nexus Google has a Nexus over? tablet. That's the thing. <laughs> People keep saying there's there's something coming. I mean, the Motorola Zoom was a Nexus tablet. They need um, another Nexus tablet. They need a, they need a 4.0 <laughs> Nexus tablet. No, they don't. I mean, you've you've essentially got that in honeycomb tablets. There's if you pick up a honeycomb tablet and you pick up an ice cream sandwich tablet, you're not going to see that much of a difference between the two, at least as far as they look. Um, they're they've been too damn expensive to compete. If you've got a six hundred dollar Android tablet and a six hundred dollar iPad, you're going to buy the iPad. Period. Um, all right, so I'm going to skip Derek for a second because I want him to give sort of a, a global view on this and go right to Daniel. <laughs> Windows 8 tablets, Dan. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're going to be cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> right. No, they're going to have Office on Metro, right? Is that what Sanofsky said this week? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's a big, big play. And we've mentioned this before about how this is going to kind of change things a little bit only because Microsoft is going to have a full operating system on a tablet as opposed to a compromise with a mobile operating system uh, where you have to run different apps and code things differently. And now we know that Windows 8 is also going to share a lot of the same underlying code with Windows Phone 8. So if you code for one, you can easily code for the other. And that's going to be, I think, really interesting, the idea that you can write an app and transfer in between the two. It's not going to be one-to-one, but I mean, it's, I think it's going to be something like probably 80-20 you know, for the percentage of uh, ability to do this. And so it'll be real interesting to see how this comes about. Now, of course, this will all rely on how good the hardware is. Now, Microsoft's done a good job, I think, recently of working with their OEM partners making really compelling hardware. If you look at some of the latest notebooks, the netbooks, the ultrabooks that are out there, uh, they're really, really nice. And you can, of course, make the good argument they're really just kind of copying the Apple model. And I think that's fine, and it's, it's okay. It's a good thing to do. Apple makes great hardware. And so we're finally starting to see that come around. So this will depend on how sexy the hardware is as well as the price. But um, it's going to take a while because the Metro interface is – uh, new to people, it's a little, I think, disconcerting. If you, you know, I think people are going to be expecting like the regular Windows interface, and they're going to see this Metro thing. Uh, but I think it'll catch on, and then it's going to finally click with everybody. They're going to see Xbox, uh, Windows 8, and then Windows Phone 8 are all going to have the same user interface, and it's going to be a real interesting ecosystem. Could it replace so pre- the traditional Windows interface, Dan, for tablets? Uh, I don't think it'll replace. I mean, the, you can still minimize the Metro interface and go back to the regular start screen that we're all kind of familiar with. And I think that's a good thing, you know, so people can switch because sometimes you don't need the, the big touch uh, interface. But uh, it, it, Microsoft's taking a gamble here, but I think it's a right gamble. And I think it's a, a really smart play. And uh, I think, I don't know, I really think Microsoft's entering a new renaissance period here with all of this. And it'll be no real interesting. Plugins, Dan, on Metro. Well, that's for, yeah, for the, the Metro part and stuff on ARM that's running on the ARM processor. So not all tablets will necessarily run ARM. They could be running other types of processors as well, but it'll be a mixture of ARM uh, devices and non-ARM devices to traditional x86-64 platform. No Flash in Chrome, no Flash on ARM. Apple suddenly doesn't I'm look totally like the lone cool idiot anymore. with Flash yeah, but being I think, Yeah, and I think we're pretty much done with Flash, right? Everybody's, you know, Microsoft's made it clear that they're embracing HTML5. That's where IE9 and IE10 have gone, and so I'm kind of okay with that. It'll still be a couple of years, I think, between um, HTML5 video catching on and replacing Flash, but, uh, you know, I think we're definitely moving in that direction, and Having Microsoft adopt this and put this out there, we're really, you know, kind of like what Apple did, but this will be on a grander scale because Microsoft's Windows phone, uh, Windows operating system, it's, you know, it's has a much popular. Yeah, and it'll, it'll like force it. the industry. It'll force websites to redesign 
Uh, and we're already seeing that. I mean, JCPenney's new logo and system is very metro, if you look at it. And so you're starting to see uh, this ad- adoption of this UI almost everywhere. It's sort of, uh, it's sort of interesting to see. So. so Derek, now that you're unencumbered with a touchpad of your very own, where do you see tablets in 2012? I don't see tablets. No. <laughs> um, uh, I see Apple continuing to dominate. Uh, we saw... Uh, just the other day, that leaked a slide from a USA Today presentation that saw that their app had been downloaded more times on the touchpad than on all Android tablets combined, oh, except in the Kindle Fire. Uh, and that, that's a, I wouldn't say it's an, uh, a hooray touchpad because, you know, they don't make them anymore. It's more it's a, an indictment of the struggles that the Android tablet makers have had making that connection. Uh, and it, a lot of it comes down to marketing and that Apple is still the master of marketing these things and building the hype. Uh, and the iPad 3 is going to blow the doors off of everything all over again. Uh, I, I, I see... I don't see Microsoft having a lot of success with Windows 8 on a tablet in 2012. Uh, maybe in 2013. The problem is they're going to have a lot of trouble. You know, They're going to convince all the manufacturers to be on board and the manufacturers are the ones that really care about making money. Microsoft's going to make money based on how many licenses these sell. The manufacturers are going to make a whole bunch of these tablets and maybe not sell them. Uh, and I think that's you know some of the problem. You know, LG isn't making Windows phones anymore for a reason. They haven't had a lot of success with them. They may come back to it later, but for now, they it's not worth it for them to do that. Uh, and everybody's going to want to jump on that tablet bandwagon because they see the success that my, uh, that uh, Apple's had, but I don't think anybody's going to be able to replicate that for a while. So, Kevin, I have a question for you. Do you want me to drop break exclusive iPad 3 details in the podcast or put them up in a post first? Uh, definitely in a post first. All right, so after this podcast, go to iMore, <laughs> break exclusive <laughs> iPad 3 information. Feel Does, it it? Like it. Does it have retina display? Yes. Whoa. Well, we knew that. <laughs> yeah. Whoa. It's going to have a bigger the iPad 3 is going to have a bigger display than a 1080p television <coughs> than most than most people's computer monitors. Not bigger but denser. It's going to be insane. 20 more pixels. 2048 by 1536. Whoa. Angry Birds oh, is going to be amazing. I know. You can <laughs> they put some RAM in it. You can get all the pigs in one. But that's the other thing and I we're going to end this podcast soon. But that's the question like will Apple put a gigabyte of RAM? Will they put more storage? Or is the fact that they make the operating system and the hardware allow them to get away with using less hardware and optimizing more software? We're going to have to see because we still, we're still way behind in the spec battle with Android, but our performance is really good. So, to be continued. I mean, look at the playbook. The playbook hardware is now ancient and it's still like totally awesomely fine in terms of performance and everything it's else fantastic. on the market. It, it's as so it's it's, as anything. Yeah. All right, Kevin, where can we find out more about you? You can find out more about me on crackberry.com, on Twitter at crackberrykevin. And we also have a nice Who We Are page now up at mobilenations.com, so you can learn more about everybody through there. It's gorgeous. Ooh. Phil Nickinson, where do we find you and your Android army? Generally by the coffee pot, because <laughs> it's no, androidcentral.com, at Android Central, Google Plus, just search our names. We're all there. Nice. Derek Kessler, beautiful, gorgeous new redesign for WebOS Nation. Yes, it is uh, beautiful, and you can find out everything that's going on with WebOS at webosnation.com, and you can find me on Twitter at DKDSGN. Sweet. Dan, when you're not occupying something, where are you? (laughs) You can find me at WPCentral.com, where I put stuff up every day, and of course you can follow me on Twitter at Maltesta77, and we, we kind of do a podcast every once in a while, too, but well, actually, I actually have one this week where I have a special guest. Jeff Wilcox from Microsoft will be with us. So Sweet. Make sure with us. Sweet. Yep. Nice. And uh, you can find me at Rene Ritchie. You can find me at imore.com. You can find me at mobilenations.com. And you can find all of our shows at mobilenations.com slash shows. We are here every couple of weeks whenever the news demands it. Um, I'd like to thank everyone in the chat room for joining us. I want to thank all my co-hosts for being here. And I want to wish everybody a fantastic mobile week. Yeah. Kevin out. Kevin out. Happy Valentine's Day, everybody. Happy Valentine's Day. Love your smoke. Love your phone. Just don't get arrested. <laughs>